Mark. I'm senior solutions architect um, based out of Germany for MongoDB, the company behind um, the technology. First, um, I want to know a little bit about the audience. So, who is um, who's working already with with us as a database? So, so, and who knows us and basically what what our database does, or how is it? Most of you. Uh, two thirds. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, I want I want to run quickly, or I want to run about like why we are here. I mean, the the database itself, MongoDB, where it comes from, and what concepts are there. And some of you might already aware of it, uh, but feel free to ask questions uh, during during the session. You said I have roughly one hour, so the slide deck is not that super long. Uh, so I. I will uh, try to address like ad hoc questions. It it won't focus on um, uh, that much on Java itself. It will focus a little bit more on the database and what you can do with it. But we can uh, iterate over. I, I just checked uh, the um, the pens there, so I can draw some boxes and lines if you want. So where where are we coming from? Uh, MongoDB is a document-oriented uh, database. Why are we here? Because our founders um, created, uh, they worked a lot with relational databases in the past, and they had to uh, suffer from some of their issues um, they encountered. So they had um, polymorphic data. So they had, um, let's say, some. Um, they had a product catalog, and some of these products they have an attribute like a color. Some of them not, and so on. And if you want to do work with it on the relational database, you have to normalize everything. On the other hand, if you want to have a quick response, you denormalize. So they thought of a new way of storing data, or let's say an historic way, pretty similar to really old storage technologies, let's say hierarchical databases. So they were inspired by that for creating MongoDB. Um, one driver of it is also the, let's say, the agile development. So um, today I spent, I think, almost the whole, whole day at, at Amadeus here around the corner, and it's about Scrum and Kanban and all like real agile development there. And I have the same thing at my customers in Germany. Uh, one is um, dropped a complete relational database in favor of, of MongoDB, and they could do in the past only um, one or four deployments a year for their e-commerce platform and now they do multiple deployments per day. So they, they swap completely from a monolithic architecture to a microservice or service oriented architecture um, and one driver for that of course was agile development. Um, on the other hand, um, one reason why MongoDB exists is um, the need of storing a lot of data. So about 10 years ago, um, a little bit more even, like big companies like Google or Facebook came across the issues of, of, um, of storing a lot of data or um, querying a lot of data. A lot means that much a normal database couldn't handle. So they came up with new ideas and called it NoSQL. And that were the origins of um, a big table, Cassandra, uh, for example. And we were also inspired by that. So the database should handle um, a lot of a lot of different uh, varieties of data. On the other hand, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, the big volume or high throughput um, of data. And the the last bit of our like of our pillars um, is that. You want, as developers, uh, you want to be more flexible. Like DevOps is is what um, companies and also like smaller development groups and universities are doing. So you want to um, write your code and you want to deploy it somewhere. So maybe even on the database as a service platform. And one customer uh, has a lot of different, or one prospect has a lot of different use cases with a lot of different storage uh, needs. That means also a database is not optimized for the storage, it's optimized for the need. And the need means sometimes a lot of data, sometimes not that much data, which means that you cannot say, I have one machine for everything, uh, like you 
usually have in the relational world. You want to have, you want to be more flexible, so you want to use virtualized infrastructure, um, VMs, or uh, nowadays maybe even Docker infrastructure. So you want to you want to use that to scale out horizontally with without the the cost, the big jumps. For example, if you have a booking booking engine which suits, uh, like your hardware suits that use case pretty well, everything's fine, uh, but you paid, I don't know, a couple of amount of money for that box, um, but what if you have 10% more load? You need, in a normal database world, you scale up or you put the same box again next to it, but the box itself is quite often very expensive, so you cannot scale in small steps. So this is what um, NoSQL world and MongoDB itself does or can do for you uh, using commodity hardware and cloud computing infrastructure. So who's developer here? Everyone, great. So who's using Heroku or um, other um, application server as a service? Anyone tried it at least? Yeah, so, so, so what you can do, there are platforms, you write your code, you don't want to have the, the problem of uh, managing your application server, your uh, um, Apache web server, it, maybe it's the easy thing, but if you are using, want to use Glassfish or um, Tomcat, something like that. So what Heroku and other platforms are doing, they just uh, provide you with a GitHub end, or with a Git endpoint, you push your application there, and Sometimes it's compiled there, sometimes you have compiled on your own, um, and then it runs, right? And if you need more, have to more, have to have more web servers, you just click a button, and from five web servers, you have 100, for example. The web servers needs to talk to a database. Um, so it would be great if the database can scale also gradually. So, for example, with Heroku or other platforms, you can say, oh, I want to have MongoDB as a storage uh, layer, click it, and then you have MongoDB there running for you. You don't need to worry about it for, for an easy start. There are free tiers for it, so this is um, quite popular in the US or also in Central Europe. And I know, for example, Run Above, um, a project from a French company, um, big hoster here, uh, is uh, providing you that as well. So with that in place, you can create um, applications you could do never wrote uh, before. What we mean with that is, with the agile process and the ability to scale, you can start small, iterate over it, deploy it, realize that's maybe not the great idea, and go back again and write new stuff without the hassle of big boxes, uh, without the hassle of maybe large um, and long um, schema validation and schema changing things like if you use Java for example you have a mapper in between your your application and your database so the database is normalized the application works with business objects you want to use in the application and to connect to it you have much more than a driver you have an, um, um, an object modeling sorry I'm always mixing that an ORM layer, so um, object relational model uh, layer. So this is uh, for the translating what you're doing in the application to to the database, to multiple tables and so on. Um, and with a more flexible model, uh, you might not need that anymore. So MongoDB itself is designed not for a niche, so it's designed for multi-purpose, pretty similar to a relational database, so you can use it in a booking application, you can use it in an e-commerce application, or um, just uh, if you want to store uh, weather information and you want to calculate the average uh, temperature of Nice or in a specific time frame, something like that. So you can also do compute in, uh, computing stuff. Um, I had a recent discussion with a guy um, from pharmaceutical industry, and they store raw information of um, of chemical trials in it, and they do some matrix manipulation on top of it with other technology. They just store the raw information in one big document, and this raw information can contain, let's say, 10 trials, can contain 1,000 trials, but this is one document for them, and they're always working with one big, with one document. So a document for us is not a PDF, it's kind of an, is an object. If you're working with Java, it's your POJO, for example. 
And the last, uh, the, the one very, very important thing for us, and one reason why we are here, is that we are, um, we are an open source database. That means everyone can download it, everyone can um, try it out, and there are no restrictions. You can even start your own business uh, using MongoDB without talking to us anyway. So you, 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 you can do pretty much everything you want to uh, with the database itself running underneath your application. And this, um, this, this went to the point where we are now uh, basically the, the leading NoSQL database because we are, we are covering a lot more use cases than in general, uh, like, a, like a niche uh, database or let's say a niche product like a key value store. We can do much more with, with the database. Um, and like a lot of people on LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter are, are, are tweeting about it and working with it. We have a lot of user groups and so on. And, and we as a company are trying to drive it. I just there are two like a little bit marketing slides, but as a company itself, we are the um, we are providing the, the source code. We having the roadmap in our hand is our intellectual property. Everyone can participate in making it better, specifically drivers. So the Java driver is an is on the Apache license, um, but. Uh, it needs to have a clear roadmap for large organizations, and so that's where MongoDB Incorporate comes into place uh, with, our, with its, its customers. And we have uh, around the world offices to provide our uh, customers um, support specifically. So, um, a lot of different, I just want to give you some, some overview. So, a lot of um, large companies in the Fortune 500 are using us in a lot of different use cases. Um, and also, uh, that means, um, and the reason for that is the, the large ecosystem, and you belong to that ecosystem. So, um, we're counting the downloads, not super important that we have millions of downloads, but the most important number for me itself um, is, is this one. You are a Java user group, but we have also sometimes even MongoDB specific user groups, and we have over 35,000 people participating in the user groups across the globe. I'm running a user group in Hamburg and Munich, for example, and sometimes meeting the guys in Berlin. Um, there's a user group in, in London, and they talk about the use cases and also finding new people for their projects. This is the my, most popular thing in London. I went into a PHP user group, and the PHP <coughs> user group, I thought it's small, but no, there were 150 people showing up, like that. And, but they discussed all the different things and also MongoDB integration. What I mean with that is we have not only Java uh, supporting um, MongoDB as a database, now you can connect to, to the database using Scala, using Ruby, um, using a .NET, if you like .NET, uh, and uh, also if you want to abstract it a little bit so you don't write your own uh, specific queries, you, you want to rely maybe on the framework, you can use Spring or a little bit low la low layer thing called Morphia, which is an abstraction of MongoDB. So, but uh, gives you some some features like uh, some validation uh, method methodologies. So, if you have your your object and you want to store it, you want to make sure that a specific um, field is set or if the field is um, an integer or something like that. You can you should you provide that. In the, in the application code and not in the database itself. So this is important. It sits usually in the online area of data management. So we are an operational database. You can use us in, as primary data store. And I see that from like specifically, specifically large organizations, they start with a small, uh, small project learning how to work with it, uh, using it with a specific language, and then they, they will have more and more teams adopting it. And it's always in, usually in the online area, so you want to uh, store your user profiles in it, uh, purchase information, you can even run your own your uh, CMS system in it, or catalog information, something like that. Um, and it's not, uh, not designed, but you can do it uh, for offline data processing. For example, like a long running batch job, you have five terabytes of data, and you want to calculate the average age of the users in 
that five terabytes. So this is like you have a collection scan for this, for example, or a full table scan. Um, and uh, you do that probably via Teradata or via Hadoop or something like that. So you decouple that. You can use MongoDB for that as well to retrieve it very quickly, but this is not a usual use case. Um, so coming back to MongoDB itself, we are using um, a document model. A document model means you have a J JSON schema. In Java, you don't need to write JSON, but you can uh, manipulate it from the shell. Uh, Massimo will show uh, us later how you do that uh, using time series uh, data and a time series data example. Um, we distribute data if you want to distribute your data uh, across multiple servers. Um, we have something called sharding, uh, so you fragment your information across uh, your servers. Very useful and important if you use um, um, a cloud infrastructure. So you have medium sized instances on AWS and they have a specific amount of RAM, but you need you are have 5 million customers and they use this, need this RAM, but maybe you are a more, um, you're more successful now, you have 10 million customers, something like that, so you add another machine to it with using sharding for that. Um, you can do some uh, simple text search queries, so um, that means that you can, uh, like having uh, some, some algorithm for like um, suggestions, so you type in a name, uh, and you want to have an auto suggestion. So for that, you can use MongoDB text search in different languages, including French and German. <laughs> uh, quite nice. If you do want to do some analytics on it, you don't need to swap uh, out, or you don't need to extend it directly to an analytics big platform or complex infrastructure. You can do, uh, let's say, average analytics uh, using MongoDB as well, uh, which is called aggregation framework. So I just would write it down. So what you can do in, if you query it, you have something simple like a find with a select or a where clause, all that stuff. But find gives you back one document or multiple documents which you're searching for. Um, the aggregation framework, sorry for my, can do much more. It can, if you select, um, for example, and a couple of, of user profiles, you can do calculations, so you want to know who is the youngest uh, uh, user of your, uh, of your system, who is the oldest one in a single query. You can also say, in a single query, give me the youngest, the oldest, and, and, and calculate me the average sum of the of the user base, so this uh, can you can do this with the aggregation framework, and you can also manu manipulate it even further. So if you have a if you have a document or a, like a data set uh, with a structure, you have a, usually you have a, a primary key which is ID, uh, you have name, and you have um, last name, and zip code, um, but you want to combine this and the result for whatever reasons. Uh, so you can restructure this document in a way that it's retreat, it gives you back the ID, name plus last name, like, um, for, for like in, in one string, and you can rename it as, I don't know, full name. So you can do quite interesting things, and this is specifically interesting for dashboards, uh, for if you want to do real-time um, analytics or near real-time analytics. And if you do want to do some basic um, iterations, for example, you want to do a, a k-means clustering thing, uh, you probably end up in using a MapReduce, so we're supporting MapReduce as well, but you, if you want to go down that path very, very deep, or you want to add uh, like a streaming a system like um, Storm or Spark, you can use MongoDB's Hadoop connector and you can write, uh, um, so, so your, your Spark or Hadoop system can read from MongoDB and write to MongoDB as well. So there, 
there's, um, it's quite easy to extend it as well beyond the normal features of the MongoDB. On the other hand, um, when you want to query, um, and this is important uh, for us as a general, we call it a general flexible uh, index support, is that uh, a key value store can only, you can only query on an ID, on a specific ID, and everything else is just a blob where you can't do like uh, these calculations usually. But in MongoDB you can do ad hoc queries on, on every piece of the document itself. So you can, you can uh, query for a name, for a last name, or a zip code, or a range of zip codes for example, or age. Uh, so range-based queries are possible. Um, and if you want to do want to do that fast, for, uh, you need to have a kind of an algorithm uh, to retrieve data fast. So you need indexes. So you, we support indexes also on on different fields than just the primary key. And this gives you a lot of flexibility and in queries, um, as I already um, said about a maximum, minimum, all these things. But ha what happens when you are fine with the database, everything's great, it's on a VM in a data center in Dublin, where AWS is usually, uh, and on availability zone 1, and the SLA on the availability zone there is like 99.9, .9, so a bunch of time where the, the server might not be available. So you want to have some, um, um, you want to have high availability, so if a failure, a failure, if you have a failure on the system, on the MongoDB cluster, or you want to uh, update your volume, you want to update your, uh, your server, uh, so operating system things, maintenance, you can use MongoDB's replication, uh, which is built into, in the uh, database. Um, I will go into uh, the replication a little bit later. So. And of course, we support some uh, uh, security features like X509, LDAP support, and so on. But this is probably not that super important here. Um, last thing, which is a niche, uh, uh, and a specific um, thing which we support is you can. I said you, you don't usually don't store a PDF file, but you can store large binary files, for example, a PDF. And we have quite a few customers using this feature means that you have a file like for a CMS system and, and some meta information so who created it, when was it created and so on and you can combine that in, with the binary information and store it in MongoDB and this is called BritFS. This feature is quite popular uh, in, in some and specifically in the media uh, scene where they store uh, a lot of photos um, or PDF files like banking. Um, I have one one customer. They actually store their their monthly salary receipts in in the in, in it or the salary the, the stuff they send out to their clients. They store it there, also with um, iterations over it, and they can easily extend it um, on it. So. Um, Talking a little bit about use cases um, is like, as I said, we are all, almost in, in every technology. Um, I, I uh, said uh, we were today at, at Amadeus, and there's a lot of interest in, in us in the different areas. Uh, and this is not bound to a single single use case. Um, just naming um, my, one of my customers I'm working with is Bosch, and they do IoT. So they have Arduinos, uh, nodes, or cars um, driving around, producing every second information about your speed, uh, who's driving, uh, for example, um, or uh, where they are, so geo positioning, and they use um, geo queries to, to select the who's, wh uh, which cars around them, and report that back to uh, like a trucking, uh, like a company who's doing trucking or for example like when you sit in your luxury S class or BMW 7 series whatever you can kind of press on the button and the, the guy at, uh, can help you and see where you are they have a mashup of Google Maps maybe and they can even see your uh, your engine data for example um, so uh, 
um, this is, uh, I will share that later on. Um, we have, of course, a lot of uh, resources about case studies and so on. The most important ones for you are the presentations itself. So we cover a lot of different use cases and discuss it also and in terms of um, development, how it is useful in Java development or in Ruby or something like that. And, and you can use our online training, which is free. Uh, and there's a Java developer course, uh, for example. And you can uh, re register for it. It runs every, uh, every week, but it starts every eight weeks, roughly. And you learn there how to work, uh, how to create a schema, how to query, how to delete, how to uh, use advanced features like, um, for example, a time to live index, uh, which is a mechanism in MongoDB to delete data automatically based on a time. For, so you are uh, you don't you don't want to have data older than two weeks or thirty seconds if you just want to store the last thirty seconds, something like that. Um, so I want to quickly go into how are we doing this. Uh, how we achieve a better performance maybe than other ones. Uh, so one thing is a data locality. So we have a document here. I, this is a super simple document. Uh, you have a name, a last name, and a zip. But uh, maybe a day or two days later, you decide, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I want to store also my, my friends or my top five ratings for products and the product name. So you, what you can do is create substructures inside the document itself. So you don't have a flat, uh, flat object with just the key value uh, pairs. A value can be, again, uh, an object or an array of objects. And you can work with these arrays also if you want to. And we store this all together in one document. And when you retrieve it, of course, it's uh, faster than if you, do, uh, uh, if you have a, no a denormalized uh, infrastructure where you have to lock different tables and scan this across uh, the, the, the volumes and uh, get it back to the, uh, um, to, the, to the database and serve it out. Uh, another thing is that you, if you insert or update, specifically if you update something, you update only a part. So if, for example, if you want to replace the last name, you don't store what you usually do with, uh, with a lot of databases, the whole document. So you only update that piece which is much less data, which is going over wire to the database itself. Um, <clears throat> I said we do this scale out with sharding. And, um, that means that you, your, your data itself, like your user, user information, like my user information sits there, and Massimo sits here, and so on, and, and you can elastically extend it, but also remove it. I mean, you can only remove it if you have enough storage on, on the other ones, but you can do that um, during the runtime. Um, so this is, uh, so this gives you uh, the availability of scaling as you want to, uh, adding, adding more disks if you need to, while you don't need to uh, turn off the application. Uh, do maintenance tasks and, and start the database again and start the application again, you, can, you don't need to do that um, with the database itself. Um, and the high availability, and this is the concept I want to draw some pictures about it, is done by the database itself. So you have your application, you have uh, the driver, the Java driver for example, or you use a framework Spring which comes with the driver. And the driver, uh, you give the driver an endpoint, like an address of the database server, of one database server, or multiple if you want to. And it, it detects automatically where is my primary. So in a normal uh, relational database, you know, may know the concept of uh, primary, secondary, uh, uh, master-slave. <coughs> so it's pretty similar to master-slave, with one big exception, uh, which is a secondary can also become a primary. And I will go over that in a, in a second. So it will connect to the primary server and talking to the primary server for updates and writes. So inserts and updates. And the secondaries are having are connecting um, directly to the primary and fetching the data. Uh, these secondaries can be in one data center, but also across the globe if you want to. 
and if you update something, it will does uh, it will do the, this in an asynchronous uh, process as well. So what happens if um, the second when you want to what happens if you want to do uh, a maintenance task? So you maybe turn off uh, turn off a secondary and uh, do maintenance there. Then you do it with the with the second secondary. So you now you have here updated server, and then you say to the system, um, please elect a new primary. This will get then these both will decide who will be the next primary, and you, then you can do the uh, uh, the maintenance tasks here. To give you a picture of it. Sorry, I'm stepping off the picture of the... No, no, but I'm not sure that everyone can see the okay. whiteboard. So, we should no. Well, okay, so maybe I'm using the example. I will not... Um, <laughs> the wall. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. So, to do, how, how, uh, did, to, to do that, these three um, servers, they need to talk to each other. So they're having, technically, they have a heartbeat it circles all the time, seeing are you healthy, is everything fine, or if an operations guy decides, oh, let's put another server to it, and they detect it, put it into, the, uh, into this uh, replicated cluster, and, and, and add it to it. Uh, it, it. When you add a new one, it detects, oh, I have no data, I need to sync it, so it will uh, fetch it uh, from the, its nearest node, uh, or the primary and fetch the data while the application is working um, with the database. Um, and if you turn, uh, you can say, as I said before, uh, you want to turn that off. And these nodes know each other. They know there are three nodes, for example, and two, uh, two nodes are left. And these two nodes can vote who will be the next primary. Um, so you need to have more than 50% of the available nodes to elect a primary. This is important. This is uh, the reason why, for example, you cannot have two nodes uh, only, because one node cannot decide, do I have more than 50% visibility, except both are there. But if you have just two nodes and you just turn on one, then one of the two is left, so you cannot decide if it's a primary or not. In that case, it will automatically fall back to be a secondary, and you can, from the application perspective, still read from a secondary if you want to. And when you turn off uh, more service again, it will automatically uh, elect the primary. And the driver does the job for selecting uh, the primary, detecting who is the primary, and uh, automatically uh, and using uh, uh, the connection. So you don't need to worry about that in the application, except for the part that there is no primary because it's uh, you, you do a failover. Um, you cannot write for a, a period of time, so you have an exception uh, that I can't write. And then you can retry, and then there is the primary again. You can um, continue to write. The whole picture looks a bit more complex. So if you do that on the scale out basis, you have a shard with a with the primary and secondary. Um, and you have multiple of these, and the driver itself is talking to something called a query router, it's called MongoS, and this query router knows where the data sits. So if I'm searching for my, for my profile, where is Mark, it knows our, um, uh, the user profiles are distributed by the first name, maybe it's, maybe it's not the best uh, cardinality, or it's an okay cardinality in, in a way of uh, distributing data, but for example, every Mark would sit then here, if you distributed by the first name with a C. And Massimo might sit here and you are sitting there. So um, it automatically detects where it is and if you add more information to it, it will automatically uh, put it uh, to the shards where there's um, uh, where it's low where, where the where there's enough space uh, basically left. So it will automatically detect how, how much load is on which server in terms of volume uh, like amount of data and uh, will also move data. So, for example, you have 5 million users and there's a new uh, country coming in, um, I don't know, Iceland, for example, where you have a lot of Bjorns living or something like that. Then it will detect uh, it, um, 
where, um, where it needs to move the data into and automatically split the, the data across evenly across, if possible, across uh, the servers. So from the development perspective, if you want to scale out, you need to think about how do you want to scale out on which, on which key, basically, of a document you want to scale out. So if you have user profiles, do you want to use a profile ID? Or is it the surname or the postcode or even a, or a combination? So you can use postcode and last name, for example. And then every um, 001 postcode with a mark as a, as a name sits then here. And 001 with, I don't know, Maximo would, might, might sit also here, but might sit, sit there. So this is a possibility you can do. And I think you will, uh, Massimo, do it. Will you show something about sharding in, in type series? Okay. Uh, is that when when you use when you're using type series, you come across uh, a point where you might need to scale out a lot of data, um, and then you have to decide on what you want to uh, what you, what you want to scale out. Um, so. I think, yeah, if, um, if you now decide, okay, great, MongoDB is fantastic, uh, but I don't want to use Heroku, I will have my own web server, and I want to work with my own database server uh, on AWS or not, and you might need to uh, think about how can you control this server, and we have something, and this is provided by us, um, for like a freemium service means that you are able to manage MongoDB, a MongoDB cluster with a given amount of hosts. So you give the MMS service hosts where MongoDB can be deployed. Um, and one thing, if, if, you, if you start developing MongoDB on your, on your laptop, it's fine, it's running smoothly, everything's good. But when you reach a certain scale or you want to have a bulletproof uh, web server with a bulletproof database underneath, you should follow best practices in deployment, right? So, uh, right operation system level uh, settings, uh, through security like SSL enabled, all these things. Um, maybe even volume, uh, which file system you're using, X4 for example. We have a long document, what you should do uh, when you use the database. Um, and MMS can um, can control like a, or can make sure that your deployment runs fine, and will uh, will use uh, the recommendations. And if we introduce maybe a new system to store the data, a new type of storage engine, for example, it can also flip over to new recommendations. Maybe we recommend another file system in the future, something like that. So it can. First, it can provision your cluster, it can upgrade your cluster, so new new MongoDB version is out there, you can download it to your, uh, to your, um, to your uh, main server, where, uh, or it's already there, and then you can decide, okay, I want to upgrade my whole cluster from version 2.6.2 to version 2.6.3, uh, or version 3.0, something like that. Right now, to give you some background, uh, MongoDB has the version uh, we are in 3.0. Um, we always it's pretty similar to Linux. So last version was 2.6. Now we're 3.0. Next one will be probably 3.2, and the numbers behind it are the iterations over it. So we are 3.0.2, I believe, or 3.0.3. Um, and this gives you also something interesting, which is backup and restore. So nobody, like a developer, usually not takes care of backup and restore or it's, that's a less interesting topic because it's super boring to set up an infrastructure for, for backup. And MongoDB, uh, the MMS service, can, uh, it can provide you that. So you can select the database which is automatically backed up and you have a point in time recovery. You can do everything on your own if you want to. Uh, as I said before, it's completely free. Um, and then uh, do file system snapshot and store it on a on a tape drive or whatever you can do that, but you can also use our infrastructure as a serv uh, like MMS is a software as a service for you, or you can even run it in your own uh, data center if you are an, a customer of us. Okay, so this is kind of the 
overview um, of MongoDB itself, what we do, um, how how we deploy it in a like 5,000 foot perspective. Um, just open question to the group. So, what is what is the topic you are interested in from 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 here on? Any questions so far? Uh -huh. So the, yeah, the question was like, can you create a, a bidirectional replication, for example? So this is something um, not possible with, let's say, MongoDB itself. I mean, you can create it on your own if you want to, but MongoDB concept is a single master uh, principle, so or pr single um, primary. Um, so you have the application, you have the query router in. A, in a large set and you have one primary and there's the single source of truth in it. So you cannot have multiple primaries, so active active in, in terms of database is not possible in, in that way. Um, so you're talking directly to one, uh, one, one uh, system here from the application perspective. If that's not enough for scalability reasons, you scale out with this. So we have customers with over 200 charts in place uh, most of them are, are much smaller. So, for example, I have an e-commerce uh, company using a, a MongoDB in a, in a service-oriented, and some parts are even microservice-oriented. They don't even use sharding uh, for the for the e-commerce system, and this system is quite large. The whole data, the whole data set, if you count all the data together, uh, it's, it's still less than a terabyte. So, about the the um, they have over 450 uh, page views per second on the system. It's the most popular, the second most popular one in, in Germany, running MongoDB underneath. So they use just replica sets. So a uh, product catalog sits in one replica set. User profiles sits in a, they are sitting in a different replica set. So what they did, architectural wise, and that's why they don't need this cost data center and multi-master thing is that they separated the concerns of the application. So it's not only an e-commerce uh, system, which it was before, it's now a layer, they use Varnish, for example, and underneath there are different parts. So one is the shopping basket, one is, um, one is uh, uh, the, the user profile information, one is the user tracking, right? And then, then there's even suggestion engine. And the beauty of that is that you can replace uh, these different pillars of the whole stack easier than to replace the whole, uh, if you want to update something you need to make sure that everything is updated. So every part of it, the shopping basket has a completely, they had a different schema uh, of, a, of a user maybe as, um, as a, the user profile itself. So a user profile application is storing the user profile in its own way. It's the golden record for the user profile. But the shopping basket needs to know where where it needs to send the, like the parcel to, for example. So you type in your stuff, or you, they, they're getting this stuff via a REST API interface from the um, the user profile system. Right. So this is the way how um, how uh, like the modern application development and in, in, in most organizations are now run. So they they separate. The concerns of their general use case, say I want to have an e-commerce platform, uh, e-commerce system into several different applications and these are handling their own data and if they need to store other data they had to, uh, and need to retrieve it, they ask the golden record system for it. So this is the, the way how they, they do it. Does that answer the question? Cool. You mentioned that uh, the records are updated in place. Yes. Okay, this is a good point. Um, uh, I can use that feature. Um, so, what happens if something is fading, right? So, I said MongoDB makes uh, take sure, uh, make sure that your data is updated on the primary. So, you write data to the primary, you retrieve data in general from the primary. You can also read from secondaries, but in general, you read from a specific from the primary. 
an operation itself, like an update, in-place update, can be successful or not successful. There's no half update. So an update statement can be introduce a new attribute, age, right? I'm age 37, put it, I set it or born on, and incre increment a counter and uh, add something to an array. This could be one operation, and this, op this operation is done uh, completely or not. So if, if the primary is fading in between, it's, it won't update it on disk, for example, or in, in memory. So uh, it will be successful or not, so there's no halfway updated information. If you're really serious about, okay, this information is super important, and you have high availability in place, but you're scared of primary failure, what you can do with MongoDB is you can say to an operation or to the connection itself, I want to make sure that this operation or the operations on the uh, connection or on the database or the collection are always uh, only successful if they are um, if they reach the majority of the nodes of one of one replica set. So you wait basically for the replication. This makes the update operation a little bit slower because you have latency between it. But if you, I don't know, set the age of someone uh, and set, I want to wait for the majority of nodes, you can uh, it waits until it gets an okay from this and this or both are like each one. You can even go, go a step further, but that uh, um, will, will be beyond the, like the introduction. You can say, uh, this is in Europe, this is in the US, and this is in, 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 in APAC, and you have a couple more, so you have, can have up to 50 servers in a replica set, which is quite large, so most customers have three, five or seven bytes, basically. But just imagine you have a primary server in France, a secondary server in France, so you have a, high f a good failover in France, and then you have two servers in the US, and uh, two servers uh, in China or whatever, and then you want in an update statement. You want to make sure that this um, update statement is is progressed over at least Europe, so one server in Europe, probably the primary, or uh, and one other country, or you say at least in two servers in China, for example. You can do that in in the right concern, right? So this is this is possible. So you can extend this durability over the prime. Does that answer the question? Great. So this is, what, this is also a unique feature of, of, of the database itself. You can turn it around also. So I said you can read from secondaries. In that example, if you have multiple data uh, bases across the world, US, Europe, APAC, uh, you can um, read locally as well. So you can say, okay, I'm, I'm okay with reading from a secondary, even if there's a latency and the update statement takes, why, say, takes a while, but you can say, I want to read from the US server, um, if, if, if there is a uh, US server. If there's no um, US server, it will uh, fetch data from a different one. Or you say, I just want to fetch data from a US server, and when there is no US server, you get an exception, something like that. So you can tag servers, like Europe, US, US, something like that, or Europe, Europe, US, something like that, and then you can uh, say uh, primary preferred, so when there is a primary, so get it from the primary, when there is no primary in a zone, then select the secondary, you can even say select the nearest node, there's a computational process, the driver is running that, or the query route is running that uh, over the time, and and saying, okay, this one is the nearest node to your application server, it will fetch data from that. And that will reduce cross-Atlantic um, traffic, for example, in your application. Yeah? You mentioned briefly uh, advanced security. Yes. Uh, what exactly is possible uh, to give rights to read and write the DB people? Yeah. So uh, the question is about like security. Um, they are like security is always like a, a shaped model, like a, it's a right. So you have to make sure that your database server is not open to the world, right? So port ports are blocked. Uh, like there are some standard ports of MongoDB, and you only allow these ports in local network, something like that. 
you have users, uh, you have profiles, you can have an admin profile and a normal application profile and the application user is not allowed to drop a database, for example, something like that. You can add um, something to it, uh, you, like um, auditing, which is only available for the enterprise version, but you can try, uh, you can use it uh, as free for a trial. Uh, means that you can connect an audit auditing system where uh, in the standard standard clause there the only the admin operations are audited. So you know when someone is dropping a database from the admin level that who to blame for, basically. <laughs> but you can also audit uh, like every operation if you want to, right? And you have profiles and you can turn um, you can turn things off and on for, for, for these profiles. So you have an admin user who is allowed to extend the cluster. Uh, uh, like uh, you have a BI user maybe uh, um, allowing to um, do certain things like editing, editing a, a secondary or something like this. Um, this, is, uh, this is the way. Uh, you can use LDAP um, for mapping these, these profiles. And uh, we're supporting <coughs> other other uh, we supporting X509 certificates as well. So uh, there's a bunch of there's a security uh, white paper basically which part we're supporting and down to uh, when you want to compress uh, when you want to encrypt data. Right now you for example you need to have a third party system, but you can use encryption with this third party system if it's necessary. Ah, this is important. The question is, is it easy to configure the query router? It's super easy. You start it and it connects to the cluster. It will retrieve how many shards are there and, and will also make sure that the data gets distributed evenly and you don't need to configure it. It's a, it's a process, it's a kind of a software switch. Uh, you run it and it will connect it to the, to the sharded cluster and configuring means I need to add a shard or remove a shard or you, I want to control the distribution so you can use automatic automatic distribution but maybe you don't want to have this because you have a high peak and of course when there's a rebalancing running that might take some load of uh, like that, that will take some load of the system so you want to decide on the peak when you when everyone is uh, want to buy something because there is a advertisement running you, you turn off the balancer for a while we can do this from the admin console, for example. So this is really, you don't need to uh, decide which data sits where. This is done by the router itself. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. if I understood well, uh, when you try to write something yes. in a replica set, you mm -hmm. write always first to the primary. Yes. But you, when you try to read, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily from the primary. It is in a, in a standard phase, but the driver will always read and write to the primary. As of um, write to the primary and read from the primary in the standard. Like in the connection, you define it in the, in the connection itself, or you, you don't, if you don't define it, it's the default. It reads and writes from the primary, with a to and from the primary. <coughs> but you can, if you want to, read from a secondary. Like if you say, uh, this the, the the lower section here. You tag them as bi nodes. Slow one on spindles. They, these ones are fancy ones on fusion IO maybe. And you have these ones bi call it bi nodes. Um, and your bi application in your bi application you define your connection string. It read from a uh, read from only from the bi nodes. If there is no node for you available, there's an exception. For example. So you can control it on the application layer. Of course, you need to make sure that you tag it in the right way. So if your operation team decides these are not only BI, they, they call it analytics, then you have an error. Yeah? Okay. Uh, one question. How do you compare the modules to other NoSQL database? Yeah. Like, for instance, Cassandra. Yeah. So, um, MongoDB is. Um, it's built uh, in a multi-purpose uh, multi way, so we are aiming 
for uh, we have a very very complex uh, we we have a very complex uh, query structure. You can do a lot of uh, complex queries. You can do um, uh, you can do uh, like bounding boxes queries uh, um, for like geo, geo information, for example. You can do use the aggregation framework, and these one give you more um, availabilities in application development than, for example, uh, Cassandra, which is focusing on uh, high availability and right uh, right throughput, for example. Um, <clears throat> you still have to uh, and, and also. The concept itself, like Cassandra, is a multi-master uh, concept, um, and you um, and then there are like different there like there is a comparison page. I, I don't want to go deeply into this, but for most application developers, it's easier to get started with uh, with MongoDB um, because it's very close to a relational database. You can do a lot of things which you can do also in the relational database. Some some things. Uh, you can even do more, and, and some are not, um, you can't, you, which you cannot do. So you cannot, for example, query across multiple databases at once, or in multiple collections. So you cannot say, uh, name, give me a documents from my, my user group, and from my table collection, we call it collection when you store your data in a collection users, and collection old users, for example. This is not possible in a single query. So the question is load balancing on different on different nodes. So the standard, um, the way how to distribute load is is usually sharding. So if you have a lot of requests, uh, you probably have also a lot of, lot of data to, where, where data gets requested. So where sharding is not coming into place if you have spot marketing. For example, you have only three products and 50 million users want to get this, right, increasing a count or something like this. This is where other systems may be more useful uh, than, than MongoDB itself. But from a load perspective, if, you're, if your primary server is overloaded, it has not enough RAM. One reason why you scale up with sharding, other one is your I.O. throughput uh, is, not a, is not big enough, especially, specifically on the cloud infrastructure at AWS, for example, they, you have to pay for stable I.O., so paid uh, I.O. operations, uh, I.O.s. And, you, and there are some limitations on how many I.O.s you can get from one machine, so what you do to have more I.O.s, more throughput, is adding another shard uh, to it. So this is the typical scale-up. This is the normal scale-up is by a sharding, um, and sometimes can also scale out in terms of reading from secondaries, but you have to make sure that this that in the application that the data you get there might be updated a millisecond later after you, you insert it. So if you insert something into the primary and then you read it from a, and read something from a secondary, it, the, the, the write might not be yet propagated to the secondary. So this is why we say in, in and usually you scale out via, via sharding and not via 50 servers in the replica set. So just to summarize, the main goal of a replica set is more for data security, right. and sharding is more for performance? Yes, okay. exactly. This is, the, this is the, the main reason. So um, you might have a, a solution where you, I don't know, you have a retail market and you want to replicate your data across your 20 stores, maybe you think about using secondary, you have 20 replicas of it. But from the, per, from the architectural perspective, I would, uh, I mean, it might make sense, but in most cases you should think about like a distributed database in, in that case, maybe. You have, but because usually you have uh, a single point of truth single source, but you want to have high availability in that single source of truth. Because otherwise, you need to, you need to make sure that you, you, run, you might run into race conditions if you always read from secondaries, or if you have a multi-master concept, which master has the most up-to-date data, and other, other NoSQL databases 
they say, hey, that's fine, you do that in your application. Great. So I have to write in my application and decide which data is the most recent one. Is it based on the, the timestamp? Where is the timestamp created? Is it created on the database server? Are they talking to each other? Is it clock skew or is it the application server? Is the application server in China and the other one in, in Europe? So this is really, these are hard questions you encounter when you reach uh, a specific scale. Yeah. After, yeah. Yeah. The pizza. <laughs>